Hi, this is Jacqueline Hughes Simon. I'm here today, the 26th of March 2012, interviewing Mr. Philip Tagami in Oakland, California. Thank you very much for being here. My pleasure. Uh, where were you born? Oakland, California. Yes. Were your parents born here as well? My mother was. My father was born in Hawaii. Hawaii. When did he move here? Uh, mid 1950s, and he came to the states in '56. I noticed in your bio that your parents were divorced when you were a teenager. Right. How did that influence your life? Uh, my parents really, you know, gave us good work ethic. I went off to a boarding school in, in Hagerstown, Maryland, on a scholarship for athletics. It was uh, uh, a great opportunity to see a lot of the world. Um, but by and large, you know, uh, my parents had a real strong uh, work ethic. So uh, that really, I think, was the underpinning for myself and my brother and sister. You've been involved in some major restorations and improvements in Oakland. Mm -hmm. Why Oakland? Well, um, you know, at one point in my life, I was looking to leave Oakland and... Um, uh, the uh, uh, the late Chappelle Hayes, Nancy Nadell's late husband, uh, was someone who I had become acquainted with, and I could say really become close friends with. And uh, you know, I think that through life you collect mentors. And Chappelle was one of the people who uh, challenged me by saying, you know, um, if you're as good as you think you are, instead of moving to uh, the suburbs or moving like to San Francisco, where all the hard work's already been done. Why don't you stay here in Oakland in your own community and make a difference? So if you think you're as good as you are. So if it's so uh, easy to do, well, then do it here. And, uh, you know, I thought about that. And I was young and impressionable. Uh, and so at, I think at the right age of uh, 26, made a commitment that I was going to go off on my own. And so when I was 27, I started this company with partners and made the commitment to live in Oakland, bought a an old abandoned home that uh, had been vacant for a few years and renovated it and moved into it on Park Boulevard and you can say the rest is history. Why the Rotunda building? Well I come it's through the, by the way. Well I come through the building um, when I was working for someone else. Mm -hmm. So during the earthquake of eighty nine the building had received significant damage and was red tagged and was pretty much planned to be demolished. But a lot, a lot of local preservationists and people from the city felt the building should be saved. And uh, so one of the first things we did when we formed California Capital Group was make a proposal to the city of Oakland. The city had a series of uh, requests for qualification, requests for proposal processes that it um, put on the street between 1992 and 1997. And we were actually selected, I think, in the third such process in 97, which led to a exclusive negotiating agreement, which led to a disposition development agreement in 98, which we then closed escrow on in 1999. And then we renovated the building uh, for about, spent a little over $50 million uh, here, and then opened in May of 2001. So I, it's funny, it was nine years, a little over nine years, and so one of the first things I did when we started the new company was make the proposal to the city for this project. So you could say it's a life's work. And so we're still, you know, we, we're offices are here, we operate out of this building, and it still requires maintenance and renovation mm -hmm. in that we have new tenants coming uh, and tenants who have different requirements. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's just a kind of a dynamic, uh, organic uh, re responsibility that comes along with um, taking an old building like this and fixing it up. You worked closely with Jerry Brown when he was mayor during Oakland's boom year. Do you credit him for the revitalization of downtown Oakland? Uh, he gets some credit. Uh, I think the credit goes around to a lot of people. You know, no one does these things by themselves. Cities are, in and of themselves, a collection of people who have come together and shared this covenant that they're going to, you know, live together, work together, recreate together, build a sense of community. And so the leadership that we get from elected official is important, but it's not just the mayor, it's the council, it's not just the council, it's the administration. Um, too often we adopt plastic words when we think of like the term bureaucrat instead of thinking about his career staff or thinking about developer instead of investor. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, the people in our community, in our town who care about this have an interest. Mm -hmm. And in the world we live in today, 
oftentimes if you get invested in caring and have a passion for the city, people are concerned you have a conflict of interest. And so it's led us to a society where there are more people who don't have a stake and therefore don't have an interest. And because they have an interest, they don't make decisions with any accountability for when something goes wrong. And so we have to look more towards what's the stewardship, what's the accountability and the responsibility that comes with authority. So Jerry, I think, did a good job when he was mayor. There's a lot of positive things that Elihu Harris did. There's some positive things that Lionel Wilson did before Elihu. There's some positive things that Ron Dellums did, came after Jerry. There's some things that uh, Gene Kwan has done that some people think are very positive. So, I mean, again, all the mayors have positives. Mm -hmm. All the mayors have negatives. Some have more positives than negatives. But I think in Latin you would say, de gustibus est non disputandum. In matters of taste, there's no dispute. Mm -hmm. So it depends who you are and what your preferences are to determine what is better or what's worse. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on your appointment to the Lottery Commission. <laughs> what other political appointments have you had? Well, I've served um, this community since the early 90s on the Environmental Affairs Commission, mm -hmm. on the uh, Landmarks Advisory Board, on the Planning Commission, on the Port Commission. Um, the, I was the uh, founding president of the Oakland Public Library Foundation, um, several other nonprofits. I served as uh, commissioner on the Port Board and as its president. I served on the State Parks Commission. I served on the World Trade Commission for the state of California. I've served on the California Transportation Commission. Um, and um, I've served on the Base Reuse Authority when uh, the city first mm -hmm. transferred the property way back in the uh, late 90s. I've, um, and then recently, a police advisory board, I think, uh, yes, and then most recently the state lottery board. So it's just, you know, public service is a, um, uh, many are called but few truly serve. <laughs> so it's been a very wide array of uh, of assignments, and um, it's good to you know have a good, complete understanding of how our society works at all levels. Now, while your career is real estate development, clearly you're interested and involved in politics. What future involvement might you have in politics? I ran for office in the early 90s for the Peralta Community College mm -hmm. Board. I, I, as you may know from my bio, I, I left high school to go out on the road with a rock and roll band mm -hmm. and uh, never went back to high school and got my GED. Didn't get a GED, and I only have a year and a half of uh, junior college. Mm -hmm. And um, my education was more hands-on through doing things. But, you know, the, the importance of um, doing your due diligence and actually um, reading and understanding doesn't change. So, um, you know, you still have to do the math. You still have to be able to write and understand. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you say they put a lot of pressure on what I had learned before leaving school and to some maybe the rigor and discipline that I'd have to demonstrate outside of that. But I, I think there are a lot of ways to get there. Uh, I don't think there's one right answer, and it's never in the back of the book. Um, so as long as you have the ability to gather the information and the data mm -hmm. and apply it, and actually take concrete steps to getting something done, uh, you can be successful. It's a lot easier if you're on your own than if you're going to take a more institutional approach to a career path by working for a large company uh, or corporation. Uh, and definitely adds uh, pressure uh, and um, more demonstrated track record of what you've done mm -hmm. if you're then trying to convince a client that you are up to the task if you don't have the sheepskin. Uh, or the letters after your name. So, I mean, you know, my recommendation and advice to young people is go ahead and finish your education. Um, so, uh, you know, I took an unconventional path, and I was lucky. Um, I was prepared and lucky, uh, to say the least. So. Now, some would say that the Occupy movement emerged as a response to the financial crisis of 2008. How did that crisis affect you? Well, um, First, I would say that, uh, you know, I think this type of uh, tension takes place um, throughout history and has taken place throughout history. Um, so I think there's a lot of focus on the me now society. But, you know, if we could go all the way back to 
you know, near the end of the the Roman, the Holy Roman Empire, the Roman Empire, and look at other examples of where there was this um, tension uh, between uh, classes and the perception that uh, certain uh, basic uh, decencies weren't being attended to and how people were conducting themselves uh, in business or policy. Um, so I make a lot of linkages to 1967. Now, I was only two years old in 1967, so I can only draw my understanding of that period from oral history and through reading. But if, in essence, you had the climate of the war uh, in Vietnam, you had the uh, challenges and issues of the war on poverty uh, that were just being introduced and the Great Society, uh, you had a lot of tension in regards to race relations. And so that soup, per se, uh, that cauldron really kind of boiled over and there was a lot happening in the world at that period of time. Um, this is a little different, but this generation uh, and this group of, uh, of young folks with some people who were uh, very aware of what was happening in the late 60s have kind of come together. So you have some people who um, were at the forefront of the free speech movement who have joined forces with people who are just becoming aware or coming into their consciousness about their ability and their uh, ability to organize, their ability to have a voice and to express themselves as a means to um, uh, put a marker out in regards to an area that there needs to be changed. And I think one good thing about our country's history is that that's always been a very um, consistent bellwether of the change that would come. I mean, you know, we could go all the way back to suffrage, right? I mean, every time these issues come to light, there tends to be some common sense and fairness that come out of that process. And so as difficult and as painful as it may be, uh, as we go through overcoming, you know, what you might perceive as ignorance, um, change is on the horizon. So what's the old formula? Ignorance breeds fear and fear breeds stagnation. So most of what happens is predicate on ignorance. The way it affects me, um, I think, is uh, probably, uh, I would say, miscommunicated or uh, we've adopted as a society a kind of a binary tendency. Uh, you're either uh, for Occupy or you're against Occupy. Um, I think people closer to the issue see it more um, complex than that and need to pay it more respect and understanding where people are coming from. So let me take my shot, how it affects me. Um, I would say that uh, a great deal of people that I consider very close friends and advisors are very active and supportive of the Occupy movement. Um, some of those people, but not all, uh, are uh, abhorrent of diversity tactics of the notion that violence, vandalism, uh, threats, and uh, basically, you know, domestic terrorism would be tools to uh, get the attention and hold the uh, focus on these issues because some people believe, but not all, that all means necessary should be used and diversity of tactics is what that's about. Um, I would say that uh, I look at it from a standpoint and say, uh, Oakland is a community not of the 99. Oakland is a community of the 50. We would like to be the 99%. Oakland is a community that offers a very, uh, a very understanding uh, climate. Uh, it's, in essence, uh, uh, the hotbed, I think, of progressive uh, belief, uh, challenging, I think, even the norms of San Francisco and Berkeley um, being on the cutting edge of what's progressive and tolerant. Um, so as a community, you know, we would never want to um, diminish or impinge on anyone's freedom of speech, on their right to assemble, um, and we want to promote that understanding. Now the question is, at what juncture in, is someone in pursuit of those rights mm -hmm. impinging on the rights of others? So we are a society of laws, there are rules, and so the question is, is if we afford one group um, a way around the process or system um, at the disadvantage of others, how long can that 
be permitted before others then say that's their right as well. And so that inconsistent enforcement, I think, set the stage and established a context that led to some difficulties. So there's been criticism that Occupy has no message. Do you agree with that criticism? No, I think that uh, Occupy has, uh, again, diversity of messages. So what's um, the, the gentleman who started Adbusters, you may be familiar with him, I think the New Yorker was probably the only publication that wrote an in-depth uh, view of where it really came from. And uh, another young man who is actually from Berkeley, California, those two guys got together and actually came up with the scheme of what Occupy Wall Street would be. And it was really around um, some views and principles that were quite diverse in that it embraced diversity tactics from the beginning. It was test marketed in essence with uh, anarchist groups because they wanted to see how that would play. It was designed to destabilize the system uh, more than it was designed to uh, garner kind of a franchise approach to all these different Occupy movements. So that was kind of a uh, unintended consequence which um, some celebrate and others feel was something that uh, got out of hand or out of control. Some of the suburban occupies are following the more playbook view of protests organized in front of some local banking establishments and protesting when someone's being uh, foreclosed upon, where other groups have used a tolerant community like Oakland as a canvas to basically perpetuate property destruction, uh, open threats, you know, if you don't do the following, we will shut the city down uh, and take those kinds of actions, uh, which really, uh, for a community like Oakland that uh, has such a high unemployment rate and is working so hard to reestablish itself, uh, is pretty challenging. Um, in essence, if you want to occupy the 1%, go to where the 1% are. And again, Oakland, we're the 50%. You know, we would like to be the 99%. Mm -hmm. Chief um, Kwan's handling of Occupy has been highly criticized. How would you have handled it differently? You? Well, I think that's unfair uh, uh, for the standpoint that um, there's a whole different set of considerations if you're the chief executive of the city. Um, and uh, where she's criticized, I think, was uh, is also needs to be unpacked. So, you know, let me take your question further. Uh, is the question... Did the mayor um, uh, run into issues with her oath of office? So what is the mayor's mission? You know, the mayor took an oath to protect and defend the U.S. Constitution, the state constitution, to uphold the city charter against enemies foreign and domestic. Um, she's supposed to protect property. She's supposed to protect the general welfare of the people of the city of Oakland against enemies foreign and domestic and uphold the city's laws. So one would have to apply that test. Um, so she had tugging at her her history, her tradition of being part of the free speech movement in UC Berkeley of her activism and organizing uh, throughout the years and uh, I, I think a pretty well established pedigree of that and a lot of respect from a lot of people who are with the progressive movements not movement but you know plural meaning that uh, the, the, if we could look at it from a very rigid perspective, the left has a lot more complexity than the center or the right. And so I look at the left and say, you know, people who might be enviros, uh, they say, well, what kind of enviro are you? You know, is it air? Is it land? Is it mammal? Is it sea? You know, they don't want to be labeled just as an enviro. Um, and, you know, we don't say gay and lesbian, it's LBGT for a reason, because we want to respect that people are coming at this from a lot of different interests in place. So the mayor, I think, uh, gets credit for having a pretty well-established pedigree at being pretty sensitive and thoughtful and open to a lot of different interests. Her husband, her daughter, uh, and other close friends of hers were uh, energized by the uh, coming together of a lot of people to express the, their feelings of distrust towards banks, their frustration with the government, uh, the handling of taxation, and a number of other issues, and wanted to provide a forum to let people have a place where they can express themselves 
and make sure that government was open and accessible to everyone in this community. Some people saw that as an opportunity to do good. Some people saw that as an opportunity to do bad. Some people saw it as an opportunity to figure they could advance some of their own causes on the backs of what the Occupy movement was. In essence, a Trojan horse type thing, with everyone putting what they wanted to into the Trojan horse. And um, the management of that got a little unstable. So uh, the issuing of permits, without issuing a permit, but just granting the broad authority for groups to come in and operate and organize a general strike, participating and messaging and communicating that everything in the city should, should be shut down, telling the city employees that they could take the day off, there wouldn't be any repercussions, encouraging other businesses to do the same, shut the city down. And in shutting the city down and inviting 20 or 30,000 people to come to the city and being a beacon of that progressivism, um, there wasn't really a, 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 a public safety plan, how to get people out once people had gotten in, what would happen after dark, what the staffing levels needed to be like, who the groups were that were organizing. Um, a lot of my friends in the organized labor movement, uh, I do a lot of work with the building trades and the Teamsters, and we have had long established relationships uh, on the same side of a lot of issues. You know, they were here during the day, uh, cooking food, organizing, teach-ins, doing a lot of things. But after 5 o'clock, when they were done with their day of action, and they had rolled up their tents, per se, and removed all their barbecues and took all the coolers and ice chests home and all the buses left, what was left in place was what was attracted and what was invited in as kind of an unorganized group, an assembly of people. And um, in, in that group, there were a half a dozen uh, anarchist groups. It's hard to say that they're organized anarchist groups, but I'll say known or acknowledged anarchist groups who were recruiting, who were organizing, and educating people on their plans for the evening and their diversity of tactics, seeing who they could get to participate. That in and of itself attracted other folks that had no specific political agenda, but wanted to see the fun, wanted to watch the crowd, wanted to see them light cars on fire and break windows, see if them loot stores because it was entertainment. And uh, they wanted to film it, or be a part of it so they could Facebook it or tweet it, and they weren't necessarily a bandana-wearing anarchist, uh, but they were just a young person who thought, this is history being made, I want to be here and say I was here when it was going down. So there were probably about 350 um, committed uh, anarchists from a full array of groups from... Uh, you know, uh, race-based anarchist groups to gender-based anarchist groups to just general anarchists who wanted to model themselves after the black bloc. And it's all on blog, you know, the blogs are out there, it's all on social media, it's, you know, open source reality. And then there were the people who were the 150 to 200, I'm here to watch, I'm here to gawk, cheer on the crowd, per se, and then you have to add in the 50 real media people. So there were 50, like, real media. And, um, you know, at probably starting around 7 o'clock, things got uh, more out of hand with some property damage and some reports of violence. And by 8.30, uh, a large group, uh, you know, in, a, in around 500 people, started moving up Broadway, um, breaking windows, smashing the windows in cars, breaking into stores, graffiti, basically every storefront, from 12th and Broadway all the way to 16th. And so, um, you know, I don't think anyone's ever really told of the property damage, but uh, in the world we live in today, it's fair to say that most property owners are in a situation that uh, it's not enough to claim on your insurance, and if you were, you're going to lose your insurance. So you just have to pay it. So it's, it was a, you could call it a, uh, basically just a social reform tax. So, you know, our building probably had, this one, we have other properties in the area, this one property probably had uh, in excess of $100,000 of property damage through broken glass and graffiti, but then there were uh, other properties that we had that were damaged as well. Anyway, so they came all the way up Broadway, and um, they, were, they came up unabated. 
So the uh, direction um, that was given to the police was not to engage because they did not want confrontation that would lead to uh, use of force. They wanted to find a way if there was a way to, uh, you know, get people to calm down and go home. But by the mere uh, messages being sent in through uh, third channels, uh, it was almost like Mayor went from being a progressive because she's the chief executive of the city. She then, I mean, I, and I hate to say it in a gender context because it's more in the colloquial slang, but, you know, the mayor spent a lifetime fighting the man, but now she's the man. She's the mayor. So, you know, the mayor would like you to come to a meeting to talk about disbanding this. And the people who are in the passion of the moment are like, ha, the mayor? Well, forget the mayor. We're going to. You know, we're going to show them if they don't do what we want, we're going to take over this building and do this and that. So it was interesting how that very moment, Gene Kwan went from being a lifetime leader in everything that most people in this community and, you know, I'll say in the East Bay or more progressive cities with the environment of equal rights, of, you know, trying to you know, shine lights on the darknesses in our society. She was a progressive, a leader. She was cast into the leader of the jackbooted thugs who were using beanbag rounds and shooting weapons at war veterans and using tear gas. And so, I mean, she she was appalled. I think generally most people were, uh, are generally abhorrent to that having to happen in our society at all. I think you see the images and you go like, where was that? Right? Was that in Beirut, or was that in, you know, was that in somewhere else besides Oakland, California? And um, I was here working late. Um, I had been out the Saturday before. I had blogged and uh, gone on to Facebook and communicated using social media to my friends, giving, you know, hey, where are we at on this? You know, what's the temperament of this? And here are some views and opinions I have. So my concern was the diversity of tactics and the flyers and the leafleting that was encouraging violence and confrontation with the police. And seeing that printed and handed out and people trying to organize other people who would be willing to engage at that level, we realized that it could be awkward. So we're on deadline, and we, I work seven days a week, so I'm here and it's 10 o'clock at night. I'm going to be working till 2 in the morning. I have people working in the building. I, I'm going to protect myself. So I don't know what the outcome is. So I planned ahead of time and brought a gun locker down and brought my shotgun and said if someone gets in the building and they start tearing the place up or they cause bodily harm because they want to take over and we have janitors in the building and an unarmed security guard and staff I need to protect and defend our property and protect and defend my staff and do what I think is right so um, it's kind of a last case but it was premeditated I mean I thought it through I blogged hey I'm concerned and this is what's going down. So uh, we were here working, and lo and behold, at uh, uh, just about uh, 10 o'clock, uh, it was, you know, it got out of control. And so I was called down to the guard desk. I put on my bulletproof vest. I grabbed my shotgun. I sent the security guard and the janitors upstairs, told everyone to stay upstairs. And I called the uh, council president on his cell phone. He was at the emergency operations center. I said, if you see what's going on out here on the street, and you know we secured the building and locked the building, and I was going between the Broadway side, Telegraph Broadway side, and the 16th Street side, and the crowd had rolled garbage cans into the street, lit them on fire, setting up barricades because the police had started to come on the periphery and set up skirmish lines, and um, then we got a report they took over our parking garage and started smashing out the windows and the cars in the parking garage. Well, the cars on the surface lot are primarily the cars of our janitors. So these are our, you know, janitorial crew. They're hardworking men and women, and they're not the people, you know, why are you destroying their cars? This is clearly not a BMW or Mercedes or a high-end vehicle. This is a working person's car. You know, this is a, you know, 1982 Impala, and you're smashing out the windows of this car because you're angry? But... That's kind of what they were engaged in. So it got a little emotional inside the building because we could all see it on the security cameras, what was going on. And then they attempted to try to take over uh, and did a successfully take over 520 16th Street. And there were, we have it all on video, and it's on the web. 
and there's probably um, three or four hundred people rushing the building and probably a few hundred that were in the building, smashing the front door, kind of took the building over, and they were going to set up that as the headquarters for the Occupy movement. So when people started to want to strategically locate and realize that this building not only has access to Broadway, Telegraph, Cons Alley, the Plaza, and 16th Street, they wanted to come into this building. And so we met, I met them at the door. And so when I met them at the door and they were trying to get in the door, there were you know a half a dozen people with their dark clothes on and their masks on their face with their sticks and trying to get into the door on 16th Street. So I racked the shotgun one time and they kind of backed up realizing this guy's this overweight Japanese guy with a bulletproof vest on and sunglasses at night and that shotgun probably doesn't have beam barrier grounds in it. And so they left. So then I stepped outside and the crowd backed up a little further because I was outside and I wasn't pointing the weapon at anybody. I just held it there and said, hey, you guys really should get out of here. And, you know, the police then, my cell phone's ringing because they're getting calls into the EOC that there's a guy with a gun downtown Oakland. So my cell phone's ringing and I step inside the building, answer the phone, and the mayor called and said, hey, do you know who owns 520 16th Street? And I go, yeah. And she goes, can you give me that information right now? I go, no. And why is that? And I said, well, because I'm standing in front of my building with a shotgun, and there are about four or 500 people on the street who are trying to get into the building. And um, all of a sudden, you can hear the chatter in the background, and President, Council President Larry Reed's yelling over the mayor, that's Takami, let me talk to him, tell him not to do anything stupid. So I go, hey, I can't talk right now, and I hang up. Phone rings again, it's Larry Reed. He goes, what are you doing? I go, Larry, where are the police? He goes, the mayor won't let the police come. She wants the police to come at 6 a.m. after the crowd has dissipated. I go, we won't be here at 6 a.m. There won't be anything left here at 6 a.m. I mean, they were just basically destroying and tearing down and graffitiing whatever they could, breaking windows, lighting things on fire. It was pretty bad. It was apocalyptic. It's probably not an embellishment. So that little routine with me and the protesters on Broadway and 16th Street happened a few times. And at about 12.09... Um, the police came and announced unlawful assembly and started the skirmish line and started firing their beanbag rounds and started kind of coming in and doing their thing. So um, I would say by uh, 1.45 a.m., uh, maybe t you know just right before 2, uh, we were able to go outside the building and survey the damage. By uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, we were boarding up all the broken glass and cleaning up the streets because we are going to have to be open for business. People need to be able to get around and get to work. And uh, by 4.30, myself and one of the police captains, I believe, Urshi Joyner, uh, toured up and down Broadway, and he started to weep. And he was just humiliated that the police couldn't stop it, that they weren't allowed to do their job. So he started to cry, so I started to cry. And then Council Member Schaff from District 4 saw us, and when she saw that he was crying and I was crying, she started to cry. And it was really one of those very emotional scenes. We're standing at the corner of 14th and Broadway looking at our town, our city, that we you know, try to take pride in, that's just been devastated. And um, there are a lot of people who think that what they did was really cool. And for people who spend their lives saving their pennies and trying to bring, make this a place where they can raise their families and educate their kids and make a future, um, is pretty destructive. Um, and really, for what? Because um, it didn't change anything, right? So um, I look at that, and the media assault was like nothing I'd ever seen. So overnight, you know, I, I, my email is being crowded with, you know, the NRA and uh, radio talk, and, uh, conservative radio talk shows, and will I come be uh, on the stage with Herman Cain in Colorado, you know, because he was still in the presidential at the time. And I'm a member of the California Democratic Party, and I'm also a delegate. So, I mean, I'm like, you know, that's not my flavor, right? So uh, I was like, well, look, you know, there's something to be said here, but I think that there need, there's another side of the story, which is, you know, I'm not here for the NRA. I'm not here for gun owners' rights. Uh, I would have rather done anything besides been in that position. The police should have been allowed to do their job. Uh, was that on the mayor or not? Hey, you know, it's her call. 
she made, that was her judgment call at the moment based on the information she had. You know, would I have done it differently if I was mayor was the question you're asked? It would have never started. When the people wanted to set tents up in the plaza 80 days earlier or whatever it was, 30 days earlier, I would have said you can't set up a tent here because the city's general plan and the city's open space element and the city's park section of the city's charter requires there's no overnight sleeping in city parks and if you're going to have an organized protest with more than 50 people, you need a permit. And if you're going to block streets, you need that permit. And anybody else who does it, regardless of who they are, LBGT parade, right, for pride, they have to get a permit. The um, hemp fest, when the cannabis people want to come out and celebrate medical marijuana in downtown Oakland, they get a permit and follow all the, the rules. So it's a pretty progressive town, but everyone's got to respect the fact that who else has the rights to these streets, to these public spaces? It's a mouthful. That's a compound answer to your simple question. Yeah, that's great. Right? So I think, again, the, just emphasize, exclamation point, should the mayor in, in this situation as the chief executive ever operate in, in isolation, or should she have brought this to the council before permitting um, an unlawful assembly and camping in a public space for a prolonged period of time, and should there have been a policy? Actually, one council member did bring it, and uh, it failed on a 4-4 vote. But just to demonstrate where this community was on that subject, the resolution was to issue a permanent permit to occupy Oakland, to have a permanent encampment at City Hall Plaza. It was a 4-4 vote. So it's not like people weren't for the idea. Now, after all the violence in the aftermath, after everything unfolded and all the unattended consequences of people being injured and lawsuits and property damage and all these other things that happened, uh, a lot of politicians have distanced themselves from that uh, vote. And the notion that something like that would be brought is remote. Do you see any way that Occupy could influence you or others in Oakland at this point? Um, it's kind of become a caricature. So, you know, um, it's interesting, you know, w w w let, me, let me set a context first and then let's see if we can take on your question. Um, you know, what qualifies someone to be a student? Do you need to have somebody else who's never really done anything but go to school there to validate you and to say that here's a test that you need to take? It's not a real world test, it's a hypothetical test. And after you've paid us your money, and after you've taken our hypothetical test, we'll give you this piece of paper to tell others in the world that you're ready to try something real after you've done something hypothetically, right? So I use that statement as my filling the chip on my shoulder that I'm not educated, but I'm a student of government, uh, evidenced by my 20 years of public service, and would have to first say that if someone wants change or reform, one of the first things that they need to understand is, well, what unfairness is, is happening? What are the rules that promote that? And how do those rules change? And what are, is a reasonable means and a peaceful means of affecting that change? And if it's not a reasonable, peaceful means to affect that change, is it, in essence, anarchy or is it revolution? And if it's anything short of anarchy or revolution, and it's that kind of exercise protest, well, we're not going to go to anarchy and revolution. We're just going to say it's agitate. We're agitated. What are the means and methods? So many of us who were not born with the silver spoon, I had a plastic spoon personally. How is it supposed to read for me as an individual who has paid his dues, made the sacrifices, follows the rules, um, pays his parking tickets, pays his employees, honors living wage, honors hardworking men and women in organized labor, fights for the janitor's right for a pay increase in medical benefits, literally to the point of being ostracized from the Building Owners and Managers Association for being on the picket line with the workers. Oh, but that was just that one time. Really? So at some juncture, is it our society become that binary? So you you have to choose 
zero or one, you can't be something else. So, you know, religion, political belief, trust in society and reform and change. So is it that closed down? Listening is a prerequisite to reform and change. Understanding. Um, and I'll even say, you know, the, the most misused or understood word in the English language is probably obedience. So it's not to do what someone else says. It's the duty and responsibility to understand and learn and have knowledge. So, you know, Obadiah is Latin, that's the ear. To hear, understand, learn, and know. So a lot of people believe, a lot of people think, a lot of people feel. So let's think about that. I believe something. Good. Well, what do you believe? You may believe something different. You're entitled to your beliefs. I'm entitled to mine. What do you think? Thinking's good. So that's active, challenging. It's a little Socratic. It's a little philosophical. Thinking's good. Now, what do you feel? That's also very subjective. You know, I feel I like vanilla ice cream. You may feel that you like chocolate ice cream. No one's to say that one's better than the other. That's your feelings. You're entitled to your feelings. Now, what do you know? So very few people know, but a lot of people think. More people believe, and even more people feel. So what I've experienced is this anger, hate, and distrust of what's happened in our world over the banking crisis, over Wall Street, over executive salaries, over the 99 versus the 1%, has taken friends, neighbors, colleagues, a lot of people I know and respect, and ended relationships over the debate alone over what's happened to our society and our community. And you're with them or you're against them. So if you were working hard and saving your money to build something, now that's bad. Bad. If you employ people and you work hard to grow your business so you can hire more employees, that's bad. But the fact that you haven't hired more employees, that's bad. So it's kind of a catch-22. So am I better off not making an investment in my hometown where I'm born and raised and where I live and where my kids go to public school? And should I take my kids out of school, public school, and put them in private school just because? Or should I keep my business here but move out of the community because I shouldn't be here? But some have started to indicate that. Like, we want to take our city back. Okay, well, it's my city too. I'm not ready to concede my city. So it's kind of a misplaced and misguided uh, temper tantrum on behalf of some who haven't paid their dues, who haven't taken the time to understand the rules, who haven't respected or understood the process to make change and reform in our country. So would I like to make change and reform in our country? Absolutely. So what do I do? I've dedicated 20 plus years of my life to participating in the process of respecting the rules, of the disclosure, of meeting the call of the day to respect and respond to our democracy. Now, if there's consensus that there should be another me method of government, then we have a process to do that. People, their voter apathy or their decision to or to not support something is predicated on their own laziness. You could say this way. Ignorant doesn't know but can. Stupid knows but refuses to do it. And dumb can't know. Well, I would argue there are very few dumb people. There are a whole heck of a lot of stupid people. And that's really laziness. And then there are a lot of ignorant people. But the good thing about ignorance is it's curable. Now the question is, what kind of ignorance do you suffer from? Is it tribunal ignorance? Meaning that you and the people that you were raised and lived around didn't know, but you could, but you just weren't exposed to it? Or is it pastoral ignorance, where you're presented the facts but refuse to listen to them? Uh, the birthers, the, uh, the Tea Party folks, with no disrespect to anyone who in the room who might be in the Tea Party. But here are the, here's the evidence and the facts, but you will purposely go to distort those to make your point at any cost, even when you're proven time and time again that it's absolutely malicious, patently false, and incorrect, but people hold on to that as a propaganda tool for the people who are gullible, who will believe it because they read it on the internet and saw it in the newspaper or heard, uh, what's the woman's name who was running for president? Not Sarah Palin, the other one. Um, I Michelle forget. Bachman. Michelle Bachman. M Michelle Bachman said it on news and they put it on CNN, so it must be true. I mean, oh my God. 
And so at some juncture you say, okay, well, what, what's happened where that could be permitted? So that whole uh, me kind of giving you that little rant, that little you know, full complex vomit of data was really saying it's not simple. It takes a little bit of sensitivity and a little understanding, a little bit of patience. Um, will a little broken glass and bodily harm make me not want to listen to or respect the Occupy movement? At this point, yes. There's no responsibility or accountability. Who are the leaders of the Occupy movement? Who will take responsibility for it? If it's totally amorphous to where if you satisfy the response or the issues of one individual and the next individual has a fully different set of ideas and principles and the next individual has a wholly different set of ideas and principles, at what juncture could anything in our society function and happen today? Can we organize and deliver public work? Can we find a way to transact in a global economy? If the idea is to shut down the global economy and have anarchy and return to the dark ages, that's a good path. So no personal accountability or responsibility. I don't have it, but you do, so let me break yours. Let me burn it down and let me take it from you. What's next? Right? So all of the sexual abuse that took place during Occupy, the rapes, and all of that, oh, well, we don't want to muddy the news and take away from the Occupy movement. The Occupy media circus was, oh, that's just the violence of Oakland. That's what happens when people are held in poverty and they're frustrated, so they rape. Excuse me? No. It was people who were part of the movement who don't respect other people's rights. Therefore, they broke into building. Now, hey, wait a second. My mom, who's a Mills resuming student, by the way, who was a late resumer for her undergraduate and her master's degree at Mills, she came out and protested with Occupy when it started. And she used, got access to the building and brought people with her to use the bathroom. And the security guard was going, your mom's coming in with some people to use the bathroom. So I called my mom and said, Mom, what's, what are you doing? She goes, I came to use the bathroom and we're out here for Occupy. She's 72 years old. Okay? She's a UC employee or former UC employee who feels that she got a raw deal and she's got student loans and she's frustrated and society's not giving her a, a, good, a good deal. So she's frustrated. She's fully within her rights to do That's my mom. So am I angry at my mom and frustrated? No, she's entitled to express her view and opinion. I support a lot of what she was saying, but was she there to support property destruction and violence? And by any means necessary? No. And neither were a lot of other people. It alienated a lot of people. So I think the movement has lost its moral superiority or its moral compass uh, because of its inability to take responsibility for those who have organized under its umbrella and have caused the, the, the damage in our society and the, really, the chaos that's ensued. And they looked to do it again on May 1st. Well, there seems to be a lot less news about Occupy. Do you think something has happened? What do you think has happened to the Occupy movement? Well, I think like anything, the media builds it up and tears it down. So, I mean, and even by their own admission, and looking at some of the chatter on um, Twitter and, and on Facebook, some of the people from the Occupy movement got caught up in li liking to see themselves in the media. So where it was a leaderless movement, some people who really had a penchant for the camera played to that and really wanted to keep seeing themselves in, in the media. So the media kept facilitating it. And it went from page one to page two, from page two, three, for three now to the, you know, the end of the paper or maybe the local section to where it might not only now be a, a tagline or a little, uh, you know, a little box, a little 50-word uh, blip. Uh, by the way, on Saturday, people protested and two people were arrested. So the media has kind of moved on, per se. Uh, now the question is, if they come back, do they have to come back bigger if they're going to use the same playbook? So if they're going to come back and try to take things over and do a shutdown of the port and all these other things, you know, is that tired? Do people tire of that? Or is it something new and different? 
And uh, we'll have to see. Because uh, surely they won't be calling me to warn me, whatever it is they, 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 that they do. Now, we're having the presidential elections in November. Yeah. Do you see Occupy helping or hurting Obama's chances in the election? I think it hurts Obama's. I mean, if, you, if you've taken the time, as you probably have, to look at an electoral map and to understand how many red states and how many blue states there, there are, and how divided this country is on some of those views and opinions. Um, I think it hurts. Um, you know, the president doesn't have a, a challenger from the left on the Democratic side in our two-party system. So, you know, he has to bear those burdens. He has to take responsibility for, uh, and it has not yet become um, baggage because the focus has been on other areas. Um, his uh, recent comments that were captured with his in, uh, during uh, his talks with the uh, outgoing president of the um, Federation of Russian States is probably his bigger crisis at the moment from a spin issue. Uh, price of gas was what it was last week. So uh, to keep things current and uh, dynamic, I'm sure the Republican candidates will be looking to uh, tether Mr. Obama to any number of things going on. So the question will be, Occupy in May, if it's as people plan it to be, what will that then be for the president as we lead up to the June primaries and the general election in November? You know, where will the country be? Um, so the president has made some speeches about differences in rich and poor, uh, it's not a new concept. When Jerry Brown was running for president in 1992 with his 1-800 number against Bill Clinton and others, he was, uh, you know, down in San Onofre <clears throat> uh, and down in San Diego and down in, in Santa Cruz giving speeches about the disparity of wealth in the country at that time, that the top 1% controlled $8.5 trillion in wealth and the bottom 90% controlled 5 so, I mean, that, that you could say, is, is that prophetic? Well, I mean, you know, we've been looking at this for years. Has the rate of acceleration changed from what we saw take place from the 2000s on? Yes, the last decade saw, you know, you know 13.5% growth over base year, over that previous decade in what's happened here in the country. And because of the volume and the size of the dollar amount you're talking about, it's, it eclipses anything that had ever been seen before. And it's alarming. Now, that said, uh, should people who have money not invest? So should we take it from them? And so how do, how do we address these issues? So you go to the grocery store, you buy your groceries, you're leaving the grocery store. Should everyone who doesn't have the money to go in the grocery store be able to reach in your bag and grab something out of your bag of groceries? You'd say, no, that's my bag of groceries. I've earned and worked and saved my money. Yeah, but I don't have anything, and I'm on the street, and it's all relevant. Give me some of your groceries. So that's one of those challenges. So I, I look at it and go, we, we need some adult supervision, and we need it now. So let me ask you one more question. If you were advising Occupy, yeah. what would you advise them? They need rebranding. And they need a mission and a message and specifics. So you can't be all things to all people. Um, you need to uh, take some responsibility for what you do if you're going to be sustainable. If we're going to have lasting change, um, reform worth doing never happens fast enough and you never do enough of it. So if you're going to do a revolution, say you're doing a revolution. So, you know, understand there are consequences. Um, you know, it's a little corny, some people would say, but it was real at the time. The, the Steve Jobs and Bill Gates of their, of their era, the founding fathers, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. Now, people don't talk about sacred honor anymore, but their lives and fortunes, I mean, they were dead men for signing the Declaration of Independence. And that's just, if they lost the war, 
it was sedition, they would have been hung or shot, right? That's what it was. So that's a question that we look at, and that's not very long ago that people were willing to stake that. On the lives of on the streets of Oakland every day, there are people who put their lives on the line over their drug turf. And that's what they do. And that's their business. So they pledge their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor every day. You were mean mugging me. You looked at me funny. You were in my turf. And there's a shooting. And that's what's happening in Oakland every day. Part of the culture, the drug culture, that is part of our city and a lot of cities like it in our country. So how, is, how are the rest of us affected by that? So we look at these types of issues and say, you know, how, what would we communicate to the Occupy movement? Well, who would we communicate that to? And if they're willing to take that lead from someone who would provide the leadership to say, let's set out these few things that we would like to change. Let me close by, on that question by also addressing one of the methods that is a gr- crowd control, group think dynamic there was a very interesting tool that was used by Occupy, was the General Assembly. So if the three of us here today in this room decided that we would all go off and have a list of ten things that we wanted to change, and we wrote them down, and then we came together and voted, let's vote what our mission's going to be. And then we all voted and agreed that those 30 things were, that's our manifesto. So because I want you to vote for mine, I'm going to vote for yours, and because you want me to vote for yours, I'm, you know, we all agree. Then we each go out and get ten people. And we're bringing them in and under our charter and saying, these are the ten things that I'm down for, and I need your support, you're my friend, and aren't you down for these things? Yeah, I'm down for that. So we're going to get together and we're going to do our finger gestures and our little baseball steel signs, and we're all going to agree that that's good. So now every time we grow the crowd, you need 90% by consensus to overturn that. It's not achievable. It's mathematically impossible, especially when it's at night and there are intimidation tactics and organizing going on to get people to go that direction. So the General Assemblies, that's not democracy. Whose idea was this? Is it in writing anywhere? Who's keeping track of this? Where's the Constitution? Where are the bylaws? Where's the charter? It's not like transparent. So those arguing against transparency, those arguing about the heavy-handedness or the high-handedness of government and the lack of access to it have created their own government that is not accessible and open to the people. There's nowhere to get what was decided or who wrote it or who decided that. So it became this kind of that group think and a lot of people, this one young woman, very bright woman, Rebecca Salzman, who's also involved with the Young Democrats, she had a terrible experience. She went down and she was trying to, she was so fired up by it. She was calling me and emailing me. I think you have Occupy wrong. You know, I think I have a different opinion on it. And so, um, I wanted to respect her. Now, she's very bright. I've known her. And I think she's on the cutting edge of a lot of issues. So I was like, okay, let's talk. And we had really good discussion about it. Um, and I learned a lot. And uh, some of the things and some of the views and opinions that I you know, held, I realized, well, I'm feeling that, or I believe that, but what are the facts that lead me to that conclusion? So she gave me some good insight. Then she had her experience where she tried to introduce some things at the General Assembly, and in essence what she learned was it was not what she thought. And so she wrote about it, and it's on her blog, um, and I think... Um, she go, her, her blog name, I think it's called Bex. Uh, anyway, she wrote about it, and um, it was very eye-opening to me. And then she re- realized, well, maybe this isn't what people think it is. So it's kind of an interesting uh, point I want to make about what Occupy really is. A lot of people don't want to talk about it because their fear, their fear of reprisals. I've had threats, um, you know, all kinds of threats, Physical bodily harm, um, anonymous, you know, uh, the, literally the emails, you know, we are going to take over your computers and plant pornography on your uh, email server and call the FBI. They have to prosecute unless you give us $40,000 uh, to help support anonymous. 
I mean, all kinds of, you, I mean, I'll show you the emails. All kinds of wild stuff, uh, then you then go, wow, do you have to worry about your family? Do you have to worry about your children? Um, because there are some fringe people who get caught up in that moment, and they can't differentiate. They think that they're foot soldiers for the reform and the change and the revolution, uh, and they've been led to that conclusion. And then you have to worry what they may do. You know, we, uh, <clears throat> I replaced the flag at City Hall after the building was broken into on the last riot, and the flag was stolen and burned. And um, I would defend someone else's right um, under our Constitution to buy their own flag and burn it. Go ahead. You know, that's cool. But don't steal the flag that belongs to Oakland and everyone in Oakland and burn that so the city doesn't have a flag. So the city's position was, we're not replacing the flag. I go, excuse me? The American flag? I mean, come on. I mean, are you kidding me, right? I mean, what is that? Really? So I said, you know, the city, well, controversy, budget issues, I'll give you one. So I bought a flag and gave it to him. Now, walking with the flag, you know, no fanfare, just walking across the pl plaza. I was spit on. I had things thrown at me. I was challenged to a fight. It was physical, like, confrontation by a group of people who were hanging out by Occupy, and they said, we're going to burn that flag, too. Wow, that's heavy. And I just, to re you know, and so it was a little unsettling. They know where I'm at. They know I'm here. City Hall's there. The flag's still there. But at some juncture, you have to stop and go, really? You're kidding. Is, is that what it's come down to? So is that what the flag stands for to them? It stands for a lot of other things to me. But it's just a flag. Right? So our interaction as people, that's our country. This society, this city, this city and our ability to encourage people to want to live in our city and be a part of our city for what good and bad may be here, I still want to promote that. I still think Oakland, I choose to live in Oakland. My parents were comfortable here because they were an interracial couple. Uh, I'm in an inter interracial marriage. I'm comfortable with our city because it's tolerant. I know what it's like to not feel accepted because I look different and I have a different background and I'm in an interracial marriage in other communities. And I see it, the awkwardness, right? I mean, you get off a plane and, well, sorry, Mr. Tagami, you know, we don't have any Chinese restaurants in town. Well, I'm not Chinese. Well, Mr. Tagami, you know, very interesting dynamic. Ignorance, curable, innocent, but all part of that. I'm, you know, and now after what's happened in Florida, I don't want to wear a hooded sweatshirt. You never know, right? And then you look at that and say, how terrible is that? So we, we have to find, there's got to be a more constructive way to address these issues and make the change and make the reform that is at the core of what I think some of the Occupy supporters want. The overriding consideration you know was it formed with ill intent yes it was so the owner of adbusters the publisher owns that that was his he was divisive he was trying to destabilize the system overload the system to cause a crash is that what we want i don't think we want that i think if anything people want more stability and more certainty and more fairness and more transparency that's what they want so I don't think these things accomplish it. Thank you very much. I need a nap. I'm, I'm tired after I, that. I, I, I want to. I need. I need to cry, and I need a nap. So we're going to finish up by saying Jackie Hughes Simon is finished with her interview with Phil Tagami. Thank you very much. You're welcome. 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 Tagami. Thank you very much. You're welcome.